Hi, I'm Sharon Azrielli, and we're at At Home in Canada, and you're at my home in Canada. Welcome to Canadian by Design, my extraordinary interview series where I interview extraordinary Canadians, interior designers, architects, and artists. I had the honor and pleasure of interviewing Canada's extraordinary painter, Rita Briansky, at her home and studio in Montreal in the summer of 2019. I was lucky enough to have met Rita many times because my mother is a student of painting of Rita's and she is the most down to earth and kind individual that one could hope uh, to know. At the young age of 95, Rita is still teaching and inspiring her students and all of us around her. She is a joy and an inspiration to all of us. And um, she's open-minded and um, she's sprightly and she looks with that artist eye at everyone and everything. She even asked me, I don't remember when, to come and model one time for one of her classes. And uh, that was very hard for me because I'm not good at sitting still. Alexander I met Alexander Berkovich. He was a tall, imposing man wearing a black suit with a black vest and a black ascot that was covered with food stains. <laughs> and he looked like the way I figured an artist should look. With the food stains. Just, he was... You know, and I felt myself blushing from head to toe. Um, I, I entered his studio. Mo Reinblatt was a student there. I just want to ask you one question before you go on. Have any of those people enjoyed the success as an artist that you have I had? don't feel that I'm a success. Yeah, okay, well, I'm telling you. Mo Reinblatt was so well known. In his time. And uh, Esther Wertheimer was in my class. Oh, Esther Wertheimer. See, you remember. Her idea father made purses and they lived on I think it was on Main Street or City I, Hall I actually have I have a, have a, uh, a sculpture of her somewhere. yeah well she was uh, and she did a lot of, of um, drawing char charcoal of children yeah. right maybe I think that's what she's drawing Any, anyways um, uh, it, it was a great class and Berkovich himself so was he a good teacher I was just going to say he was not an articulate man at all um, he stuttered when he talked, but um, I've been asked many times about him. What made him so important for me is that he respected me as a serious student, and he offered uh, me a key to the studio to come whenever I wanted to paint because he knew that at home uh, it was not easy. There were boarders living in, in our house. You know, when you're really an artist, you don't need, just as with Rita, she wanted to be an artist from probably the moment she was born. And she was always drawing, she says, even from the age of five. But it's so important to find teachers who encourage and inspire and also show you that you have chosen the right path and teach you that they agree with you that you are doing the right thing. And that's what she found in her teachers. They also helped her to show her parents that she was on the right path. Um, what I did not know at the time was that he had a family that were in dire straits. He was a, not a good father, not a good husband. And um, he was a good teacher. And um, 
I don't have to go into his life story. You can look it up. In fact, I have a book written by Robert Adams on Berkovich. Oh. Um, then I went to the um, museum, uh, to the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts. So and wait, let's, let's just go in order. You graduated high school, obviously. I graduated high and school. And then where did you go to study art after high school? Uh, I, I worked first. Yeah. Um, uh, First in a lingerie shop mm -hmm. in Snowden called the Lady Eve. Okay. And um, then um, I got a job at Fairchild Aircraft, which was um, in the South Shore. They were making airplanes and prefab houses that still exist on McDonald Avenue, those wow. little houses. Cool. I think they were selling for $4,000 or something. Can you imagine. And they made airplanes. And I, I, I learned to um, be a key punch operator for the IBM, um, which was the early computers. Right. And I was a good key punch operator. I decided I wanted to leave home. And uh, like I say, you know, that film that was made about me, nice girls didn't leave home at that time. Um, so I decided to move out of town. I went to New York. Yeah, well, I don't and blame you. I loved it. <laughs> I loved it. And um, I, I uh, went from the train station to the Art Students League. Right. I walked there from 42nd Street. Right. Not and far, I, it's only 58th Street. Well, I was young and I could walk easily then. And um, I, I enrolled in... Um, in a class by, um, thankfully I've forgotten his name. He was a terrible teacher. But I enrolled in the um, Art Students League and I uh, worked in the evenings. How old were you when you went to New York? In my er early 20s. And how long did you stay there? Uh, over two years. And um, And how did you support yourself when you were I, there? I worked, I, I um, went to school from nine to late afternoon and then I worked from 5 to 11 at uh, different jobs. I painted on plaster buttons in the shape of roses and for pittance and um, then and I, I had different kinds of jobs but then I got a good job at the um, IBM. Again, I, so I worked from 5 to 11. Mm -hmm. And um, it was a very good experience for me. Um, I had nice friends there. Um, and um, I came back to Montreal um, two years later. How come? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I can't. I came back. Um, what did you feel that you had learned everything you could at the Art Students League? Was there... I, I, I learned a lot. I had different teachers. I learned a lot. And I was, um, when, when five, days a, uh, five days a week for two years, um, I, I had different influences. And um, I made friends at the Art Students League. And uh, there were so many influences. It was just after the war, and um, um, there was so much um, a political and social upheaval. Um, a lot of veterans um, were students in, in the uh, school, and um, the NAACP uh, was just in its uh, beginnings, and there were a lot of black students that were very uh, politically active, what year was it? Uh, it was uh, 46 to 48. It was just after the war. Um, uh, so there was so much stimulus. And then going to the museums and um, uh, just seeing um, all the art and so on, I, I think I was ready to come home. I lived in an, in a, an apartment building on West End Avenue. Yeah. Um, 495 West End. Yeah. We were 12 girls in one apartment. 
And they gave me a going away present of a sewing box, which I still have and treasure. Yeah, so it's falling one. apart, but it right. reminds me of that. Um, I was ready to come back to Montreal and I met um, my husband. Actually, I met maybe, no, um, I, I met him when I was still in New York. So maybe uh, that's why you came back. Not consciously. Um, a friend of his, he came from Winnipeg, and um, his friend was also from Winnipeg, and he was in my group in, in the Art Students League, and we became friends. And um, whenever I went home, he said to me, uh, go say hello to Joe. And um, I had spoken to Joe before I left for New York, too, for it doesn't matter, uh, somebody gave him my number. Um, so I looked him up, and um, we met at Gita Kaiserman's house. Sure, that's another famous painter. See, that uh, one I know. Uh, you remember her name. She was then married to Alfred Pinsky, uh -huh. and she lived on Milton Avenue, and she used to have what she would call, they called affairs. <laughs> um, you know, there's that joke, you know, I'm having an affair, who's catering? Um, <laughs> So we used to go there. <laughs> um, so uh, she had a fair. So um, uh, somebody invited me to come to one of her affairs, and I said, I don't feel like it. And she said, Joe Presment will be there. What's his last name? P R E Z A M E N T. M E N T. Okay. So. Um, um, he followed me around the room and took me home and um, kept calling me and I was, it doesn't matter. Anyways, we got married a few months later. A few months? Yeah. Sounds like my parents. How many months? <laughs> uh, we, we met, I think, in November and we're married in April. December, January, February, March. Five months. Five months. Pretty good, Rita. <laughs> You know, I don't think that that's limited to only that time. I think it can still happen today. For example, it, it happens all the time. I'm leaving examples aside. But I think it was more common in those days because of the war and because uh, people felt life might be short. And in the case of Rita, in the case of my parents, there were very successful marriages. Um, my parents were married 57 years. And uh, Rita and her husband were very, very happy. Um, she talks about him a lot in this interview. And um, the two of us were idealistic artists. We never thought about how are we going to make a living, which we didn't. <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, we bungled along. And um, uh, he died at age 60. I'm sorry. Me too. <laughs> But, um, Did you have kids? We had two daughters. Two daughters. Yes. So um, now, what, you asked me what was a defining time in my life. Um, I think all important. these things. Um, I don't have one aha moment. This I always knew that I wanted to um, be an artist, whatever that meant. Was there? I, I always like to ask this question because, uh, for me as an artist, it's it's clear, so I feel like it probably is for you too. Was there anything else you could have done? Um, study astronomy. Ah. Um, actually. And did you? Um, I was a member of the Royal Astronomical Society for seventeen years. Okay. There's a dome, um, a, a telescope dome um, behind the Molson Stadium. But could you earn a living as an astronomer? Can I what? Earn a living as an astronomer? Uh, well, I never thought of it as making a living. It's just, uh, um, you, you asked me an interesting question, like why astronomy? When I lived up in Ansonville, there were no neon lights. And at night, the sky was close to your head. The stars, the Milky Way was so apparent. And I used to sit and wonder the marvel of it. And in the winter, we would have the aurora borealis, oh, yeah. the northern lights. 
And I remember especially one evening, it got dark early, it's quite far north. It's not that far from James Bay. Mm -hmm. And I remember walking home. In those days, children would go out at night and go out alone, nobody worried about them. Right. And I was coming home, I don't know from where, it was dark, I was about this high. And the northern lights were so low, they felt so low, and I remember just feeling so much part of this mysterious, this cosmic thing. And I, I, this has been part of me all my life. I think this is my defining moments. Um, this um, feeling part, I don't feel uh, small or big, I just feel part of something so I don't even know what infinite means. I can't fathom what infinite means. Feeling a part of the cosmos. Yeah, but th th that there can be no ending. But if there is an, an ending, what's beyond it? You yeah. know, it, it's beyond me. This has always been with me. Did you ever, do you feel like you could paint that or it's too much? Well, too um, a number of years back when Joe was still alive, um, and I was a member of the uh, Astronomical Society. There was a total solar eclipse in Drummondville. And we went there, and I witnessed the um, shadow of the Earth covering the face of the sun. Yeah. And um, not the Earth, the, uh, moon. Yeah, the moon. Excuse me, I should know better. And I, I drew it with the, um, the light coming from the edges. And I made a few paintings of that, which um, I sold. I think, uh, uh, in, I don't have a copy of it now, but in the archives, I think that the Jewish uh, Public Library, they may have a copy of an etching I did of that. Do you always sell everything? Do you like to keep one of every series? Um, very few. I'd like to sell everything at this point. Um, I've reached um, an age where I'm beginning to think what in the hell is going to happen to my work. I have so much and I can't stop painting. What will my children do with it? Mm -hmm. Do they do they like to keep Well, there's one of everything? How well, they how saw it in my... Um, I have a storage room with lots of paintings. Uh -huh. um, I don't know. I'm trying not to think of it because I don't want it to stop me from painting. No, why no. should it? Um, I forget what your question was. But well, well, one of my questions is, uh, uh, well, the question originally was, could you have done anything else? No, the, no. no. I knew, no, that. But I I knew was, that was the answer. No, but I was interested in many things. And I think my paintings show it. Uh, people have on occasion said um, that there's so many interests. Like, uh, like the, uh, did you ever hear of Stanley Cosgrove? Of course, I did. Of course. Of course. He, he only painted nude women and trees. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he, I'm, I'm not being critical, but I'm saying he's known for that. Yes. Artists are often known for a, a certain theme. But I have many themes because I'm interested in many things. Right. What's uh, remarkable about Rita's paintings are that she has so many different styles. She goes from periods of uh, realism, like uh, figures on the beach, to uh, she has a period where it's all these fabulous greens and blues and and uh, forest scenes to periods of um, still lifes with flowers exuberant flowers to her very stark uh, Holocaust series um, you can't uh, really pigeonhole her she um, and because she's had such a a long career, so it's very prolific. It's really very, very interesting. What would you like to do still? What are you? What would be your next? What I want is, I don't know how long I'll live. 
I'm at an age where... How, do you mind if I ask? No, I'm turning 94. 94. And you don't look it. You just, and you don't act it. Well, that's what they say. Uh, and I don't know what it means, but then when I hear somebody's 90 years old, I think, ooh, poor, poor lady, <laughs> poor person. Um, I, 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 I just don't know what it, you're supposed to feel. Good, so don't. But my aim is that I want to stay well and uh, not be a burden on anybody. I, I love my independence. I, I really like being on my own. And uh, to make a, enough of a living that I can uh, continue. I don't have any galleries at the moment. The West End Gallery closed. He moved to the Philippines. Really? So, um, and I'm not looking for a gallery now. Um, in some ways, I feel liberated by not being in a gallery. Um, you, I don't have to feel that will it sell or won't it sell, will they like it or not. I don't care at this point. Mm -hmm. um, not good for business. But <laughs> yeah, so how do you sell something if you don't have a gallery? Uh, I guess... Uh, People have to call you up and say I guess. how you, you know, how do you arrange a show in there? Uh, I'm not planning anything of that sort. I, I don't have the the um, drive or the willpower or energy. I just want to paint. And you're still teaching. You are still and, uh, teaching. I love teaching. Everybody adores you. Well, you I I guys. adore them. It's it's mutual. What I find about painting, and I've told them that, is that they're teaching me to. Um, a one-way street doesn't work. I do a lot of research for them. I have a, a good uh, art library, as you can see. Um, and um, I find the books too heavy to carry now. Uh, so I photograph or scan a lot of um, the paintings, uh, printed. And um, I give them... Every week, uh, it's, it's almost an art history, uh, a short lecture um, that's relevant to the theme they're working on. Uh, so by teaching, I'm learning. Um, and um, I, I, I'm proving that aging doesn't mean you stop growing. I'm not talking about me now. I'm talking about them. Yeah. Um, Yes, uh, this Tuesday uh, I had a class and there's one man, I'm not going to name him, I don't know if he'd want me to, who um, I've known for many years, he's been in and out of my class over the years, and um, there's a time when he comes in and says he didn't feel like coming in, he, there's a kind of depression and so on. He suddenly blossomed and the last two weeks he, he's been working on watercolors he did some watercolors that were stunning. And what uh, do you think was the reason? Why do you think he suddenly blossomed? He said, because I encourage him. I believe in him. Yeah. And this is what I said originally about Berkovich. He believed in me. Um, people have often asked me, did your parents, and were they proud of you? Did they encourage you? They, they didn't know up from down in that, those days. As long as um, we were safe mm -hmm. and came home for meals, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. Uh, yeah. and, and uh, brought in some money. Um, they were proud of me at the end yeah. when, when I started exhibiting and so on. Yeah. But uh, they, they, they had their own issues. Yeah. My parents didn't encourage me. I agree. I know. It doesn't matter. If you have to do something, you do it. You got to do it. Like Louis, you heard That's of Louis Mielstock. He was such a famous artist. He died, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago. Okay. Now nobody knows him. In fact, can I tell you an anecdote yes, about him? Yes, of course. Many years ago, um, uh, he had an exhibition at the Montreal Museum of Fine Arts of his nudes. He, he drew nudes, but they were very innocuous. They were beautifully done. 
um, and um, they, they weren't sexy. They were just nice bodies, you know. And they had an exhibition, and the, um, I don't know if it was under the time of Duplessis, who, you don't, never heard of Duplessis. Of course I've heard of Duplessis. <laughs> I, I think it was under his time. Anyways, they, um, it, it was considered obscene, and they had to close it. And Louis was one of the sweetest, less ob least obnoxious men you could ever. And That's too bad. One day we were at an affair, and we were walking to the washroom together, and he said, how is the cemetery the same as a washroom? And I said, how? He says, when you got to go, you got to go. <laughs> uh, he even had two pets, two monkeys, that were called who and ha. <laughs> he had a great sense of humor. He was a gorgeous man. I'll look him up too. He never married. And um, he, he was a, a nice man. On the whole, Rita's personality is just so beautiful. And she really does uh, live very much in the moment. And I think that that's a lesson for all of us. I think that if we could all learn to live in the moment and enjoy as much as every moment as we can, we would all be a lot happier. I don't have expectations. Uh, this is something that... Uh, I'm going to say how, how I, I, your brilliant use of color. I'm going to talk about... Uh, see, I can't talk about those things. No? I, don't, I, I can't talk about um, what I feel. I put it into my painting. Okay. And when you talk to your students, do you, you don't talk about composition? Yes. Or, okay, tell but, me what you say to that. Well, um, uh, I was asked for the film um, what influences, uh, what influenced me, and I m immediately said nobody. Actually, everybody, nobody and everybody, but then I remembered there was one artist that I studied with in New York. I left the the okay. guy I didn't like. Um, his name was Václav Vitlachil, and he died not recently. He taught me how to use space, the importance of um, the space you're working in, that the negative and positive balance each other. That goes for singing, the pauses, the stri the where where you put the stress, yeah. where you let go, yeah. and um, that empty space can be as important as Absolutely. the as the filled space. Absolutely. Um, I, I, this is something that I stress a lot, and it works. And I show them examples of artists, for instance, Cezanne in his watercolors, how he uses space, and and to think holistically, to not just work in one corner. If you, if you yeah. saw the beginning of a painting in my studio, I filled the whole space with a basic shape and, and color to work on. One of the most beautiful things about Rita's eyes and the way that she sees the world and is able to show us and portray the world to us is the fact that she keeps her eyes new and with a certain, I guess you could say, naivete and um, purity. And she's able to remember the way she saw the world as a young child. And that's portrayed, especially in that painting of herself in the toque. And she remembers so clearly how she felt as a young child. We could look at anywhere right here. We could point the camera here. I wanted to draw attention to it anyway. I think this is you. I this did. Painting. Isn't this uh, a self-portrait of you as a child? Over over the years, I have used. I have a, a photograph of myself um, with that took. Can I give you um, tell you something else that was meaningful in my yes, life? Yes, please. When we were coming to Canada, 
I don't know if I should tell this. Well, to hell with it, I'll tell. Um, when we were coming to Canada, we came through Danzig, which is now Gdynia, Gdansk. Yeah. And um, I remember we were waiting to get on the ship. And I remember the ship being a wall with portholes and people waving white hankies out of the portholes. I was four then. And um, then I remember, we I guess we were in customs. And I remember a barber's chair and a little girl with long brown hair crying. That's all I remember. But I did remember that I came to Canada bald. What? And um, I had some uh, issues about my hair all my life. If anybody put their hand near my head, I would recoil. I still try not to do that. And it turned out that when we were in customs, um, th they shaved my head. Oh. I must have had lice. My, my mother swore <laughs> that she was clean, but who knows? They used to do that, yeah. And um, I remember I had a, a very strange, bad dream about it. So I phoned my older sister and asked her, do you remember? She said, yes. I asked her, what happened? Well, she said, they, you went in alone. I, I wore um, Buster Brown haircut, yeah. you know? And I came out bald, and I asked her, what did you do? She said, I started crying. Yeah. So I asked my mother. Her response was, those anti-Semites, they took this beautiful child and made her ugly. And I said, and what did you do? She said, I covered your head. I, no, she said, I covered my shame. She put a took on me. And then she said, can you imagine, I'm coming to, these were her exact words, to a new country, a new town with this. And she bought me a red coat for to come to Canada with, with artificial red cherries. On, and I remember that I wore that that thing on my head for years, even when my hair grew back. When Rita um, described her experience with her sister and um, the toque and that painting, it really uh, affected me because, um, you know, I'm a first generation Holocaust survivor in Canada. And um, I really identify with Rita. I know that I'm a lot younger, but I really identify with her very, very strongly. And um, I think we all feel very grateful to have come to Canada and we all, um, I mean, I didn't have any experiences like that, thank God, but I'm sure that that's an experience that really, I see that, I hear that that's an experience that has stayed with Rita all her life. And that painting, that painting was very cathartic for her. And, um, and that's something, by the way, that art is really important for, for, all of us and that uh, painting was really important for her to paint that painting and work that out of her system even if it took her until much much later in life to finally be able to do that um, i remember once um, the the, um, the community there was like one big family nobody locked their doors and everybody competed who was the best baker and one of the nice ladies, really nice ladies, jokingly said to me, my Yiddish name was Rashka. Rashka, she said, are you a boy or a girl? Oh. So this had, a, oh. this had a tremendous effect on me. And that winter, we came in October, and that winter, my mother's sister, who was living in Florida, sent we were three girls then. My youngest sister was born a year later. 
she sent us each a chuk, and I had a pom pom on the side with a scarf, and that became so precious to me because I was like able. An identity. It, yeah. Yeah. And um, somebody took a photograph of me standing alone in the street. I have that photograph, and um, I, I thought nothing of it. And uh, one winter day in Montreal, um, I was, uh, it, I had nothing to paint, I, I was dry. I took a bus downtown, there was a blizzard, and I saw kids come on with chooks on their head. I got off the bus, went home, I found the photograph, and I started painting that kid. And every few years, I go back to her. Um, I show this child alone on the street with the buildings on the side, and then I put the flowers in. These are dried flowers and artificial flowers. They're part of my childhood, but I call this painting Destiny. Destiny. To me, when I saw it, and you talk about the negative space, so I see the past, and then the yin and the yang, it's and the fruition of the present. Well, that's, that's my destiny. Can I bring out the other painting that's a, 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 a sort of a sister to this? This is a continuation of There's you and the tube. my sister. There's you and the tube, same tube. Oh, same yeah. Face. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is my older sister. The, no, not the sixth, the, the one that's four years old. Okay. We, we had a very special um, uh, relationship. She, she wrote the poems the the, wrote the poem, for, for my cottage series. She was a writer. So and what's in between you with the uh, um, cascading? The icicles. icicles. This is our winter uh, time. You look happy. Um, she took care of me for a while. When my mother wasn't able to, she took care of me. She was 14 and I was 10. And you're lucky to have good sisters. Mm -hmm. And one of the things I um, started saying to you before is that um, I have in many, in many ways no expectations. Uh, like when it, I used to travel a lot, and people would say, I hope you have a good time. And I didn't expect that. I expected I'm going and I'll see when I'm there what happens. And that's how I went to Poland with no expectations, and then something came of it. And um, even when I'm painting, th this is one of the things I also try to teach the class don't have expectations and I guess it's uh, you know it's, it's such a cliched expression living in the moment it's, it's what you're experiencing you start off with an idea I start off going on a trip or uh, I'm told you're coming here to interview me I I, I have no expectations of whatever happens okay. I'll, I'll work with what's well, happening they're, they're, they're yes Yes, and, or yes, but, right? Because on the one hand, you, you can say that. On the other hand, you have very, very high, um, very, very high standards. Thank you. But not expectations. Ah. I believe that Rita, through her works of art and through her teaching, um, is going to be seen as one of the most important painters in Canadian history. And I am so grateful and honored to have been able to bring you a small portion of her works today. I think we should all pray and be so lucky. And maybe it's the art that keeps Rita going, Rita that keeps the art going. Maybe we should all start painting and thank Rita for this incredible art that she gives to the world and the fact that she teaches um, and is so important to her students and gives so much back to the world through her teaching and uh, 
to the world through her art. Thank you, Rita. I hope you enjoyed this interview with Rita Briansky. For more interviews like this, please join me at athomeincanada.ca. We will have coming up Karen Murshid, Tiffany Pratt, and Frank Gehry. From my home in Canada to yours at home in Canada. Thank you and see you soon.